Hi. Hello. <laughs> I'm so excited to see you. Ooh, I haven't seen you in forever. Let's, I know. I was going to say, I, let's, let's be pretend neurotypical social people. Should we do ew, that for a little bit? Ew. How are you? How's your day? <laughs> so it's good to see a fresh faces. It's exciting Always because... Over. Because I'm an old lady, right? And then what happens when I die? All the new young people have to become old ladies by themselves. Um, yeah, so how I am? I've been sitting on my butt here from 8 in the morning. Uh, and I teach straight through till 6 o'clock. So you emailed me right after I finished my day. And I had two choices. I could get undressed into various stages of undress or <laughs> stay dressed um, from the waist up. And... <laughs> <laughs> I'm so grateful that you stayed dressed. <laughs> yes, right? As you know, Josie, you and I, we've already crossed that marker. We have. We definitely will just talk in our bralettes and not even worry about it. <laughs> we, we've we had, so the bra was kind of like the threshold of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how much concentration you bring to the table. <laughs> exactly. Don't don't unlock eyes. That's the key. And, that's, and good, good research has done this in the best position. I think so. Possible. So... <laughs> With all that said, I think it's really important. I think I get humbled every time people uh, like yourself pursue per, uh, careers um, that you may or may not know enough about all of the types of people that you will be working with, but uh, remaining ignorant is not an option because if you go into a professional field, you want to be the professional. You don't want to be that one who just looks at the textbook, memorizes facts, and then what happens if you are somebody who's truly sick? God forbid you have Lyme disease, okay? You go to the doctor and you're like, I don't feel so good, flu symptoms. And the doctor's like, oh, I give it two, three days. We all know that Lyme disease, the first 24 hours is critical because it can be treated right after a tick bite. We can be treated with antibiotics, but because you're female, you're presenting a psychosomatic. You present, the doctors have this ancient Freudian, uh, what is it, you know, hysteria. That's what they're thinking. Females will always get that kind of treatment. We are the second in line to get access to medical care that is appropriate. Let's take a disabled person and take them to the doctor. All the doctor sees is the disability. So when I was pregnant... And I was hurting under my belly and I was walking. The only way to hold, to walk was to hold my belly on the right side. And it was horrible pain. Uh, what did the doctor say? Oh, hon, you're pregnant. Everything hurts when you're pregnant. Yeah, baby came out, same pain. I had to go have emergency hernia repair. So I was lugging a hernia throughout the whole pregnancy because the doctor sees a female, sees somebody who is whining. As you get older, they'll start thinking you're drug seeking. Um, we just get these labels slapped onto us. So the worst thing you can be in America is an autistic, non-speaking, disabled uh, uh, adult who is female, who has multiple comorbidities because of autism spectrum disorders. And these comorbidities are very well known. Um, not enough people research it because every single autistic person presents with these issues issues with blood pressure, GI issues, um, bathroom problems, dietary issues, um, issues with uh, their joints, their movement. Are we going to be the first one to say, this is dyspraxia? Or we're just gonna say, mm, low muscle tone, poor motor planning. So these are motor movement issues that actually have names. And we know what to do if we have a name for it. The reason we diagnose people is so that we have a system for treatment okay so are all of you in a, a, a physical therapy or a movement kind of program or you're interning from various different fields are you all the same all the fields all fields yes okay what's the most exotic person we have here okay please someone say that they're arts history <laughs> major and they're I, interning here gosh if only that was the case no art history majors no, we, have, we don't get psyched that often. Okay. So, so basically, overall, just raise of hands, where are you coming from and where do you think you're going? <laughs> so it's a two-part question. Oh, okay, there we go. Occupational therapy. Yes, and where do you think you're going? 
like in the future what are you gonna so you think that's the route that's right like, yeah that's where i think hope i'm going okay you're hope you're going into ot and it's really broad because you don't yet know ot for whom and for what and for why okay cool next person same same ot don't know for whom for what but i think it's cool okay next <laughs> Gonna make all the money if we stay in OT. Yeah, like, right. You get forty two dollars yeah. an hour if you're lucky. All right, keep going. Okay, same thing, but with children, we've got a with, little. With children, we're getting the little people in. Okay, good. Next. Um, psychology. Okay, so very cool. Psychology, and then I missed the the last part. Social work. And social work. Okay, I got my two year. Uh, associate's degree in human services thinking I'd be a, a really wonderful social worker and then I switched to music therapy because I thought hey I could do therapy with music it's a marriage of two passions um, and then I found out what it in, what it entails when you pursue a professional degree when your competence is greater than those who are trying to train you not cool um, <laughs> lots of head butting a lot of uh, territorial arguments where, um, no, you didn't stick to the session plan, and so on. So we're going to talk a little bit more about how that looks for a professional like myself. Um, okay, pillow. Oh, uh, <laughs> development, and then I am going into the field where uh, working with children under the spectrum. Wonderful. Okay. This is so good. I get to understand where you're coming from and where you think you're going and where I come into that picture. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm kinesiology and occupational therapy. Okay, cool. I I now know how to pronounce that word. Okay. <laughs> Hello. And? Um, I'm going to be a PE teacher, and the way that I work my program is I can be a PE teacher or I can be a PE teacher that can have an inclusive program. What if you time travel and you could do all at once? Then I'd be very happy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, judging by your shirt, I thought you that would go over well. <laughs> well, I don't have a TARDIS, so. Right. Well, or do you? <laughs> or maybe. Or maybe. All right, for the love of what? <laughs> the game. The game. What is the game? Where are you coming from? It's whatever game you want to play. Okay, I'm I'm a player, I, I'm, so love it. yeah. Um, <laughs> the competition is on. I'm very competitive. It's like yeah. right, I let's... will I will race you to finish an entire Gatorade just because of Gatorade sitting on the table. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so where are you really coming from? Where do you think you're going? Um, I started. I was. PE um, kind of transitioned into elementary education, and I'm, I'm more so going kind of the children's education, elementary school, that whole route. All right. There's two, two more people on the floor. There's one more on the floor. One more on the floor. Well, <laughs> I'm seeing double today. Hi, I am kinesiology, and I want to go into occupational therapy, and I'm thinking about working with special needs populations. Very cool. Okay, so that's amazing. So what I think is, I could basically say that it's a neat uh, little kind of two out of five, three out of five, uh, one out of five, um, where I'm seeing these little pizza slices in my head where a pie would be five, and you kind of, y'all have a little either two, two fifths or three fifths of basically being in a direct service field where there is a discipline that tells you how to do it and then being more of a pioneer where you're given all these kids and you just have to come up with some kind of program or curriculum. So I was sort of uh, a music therapy major and I finished all the coursework and then what happens is field placements and then internships and all of that jazz. And when I started in my field placement, it became really obvious that I very specifically wanted to work with autistic children, and they went out of their way to not put me in the placement I had requested. They put me with a 103-year-old woman in the nursing home uh, because they have been music therapists in that region for 30-something years, and they had this monopoly, and they knew that I had something and they didn't want me to take away their jobs. So I, at the time, did not get 
or figure that out because I'm, I'm super vulnerable to kind of social manipulation and I just don't really comprehend or anticipate evil behavior because I don't, I can't conceive of it on my own. So if it's not something I'm capable of, it's not something I can imagine exists in someone else. And, in, and if you've taken any of psychology classes, you know that there is something called theory of mind. Theory of mind is the moment before all the consciousness studies, right? What is the conscious? What is the subconscious? Which one is driving your dream? Which one uh, stores the stuff like when you're high, right? What comes out then when you're drunk? Is it your conscious? Is it your subconscious? Is it the stuff you're trying to hide, but your conscious, uh, um, uh, your conscious uh, awareness is blocking your subconscious from coming out? Or is it subconsciously your wish for it to come out? These are very big questions that we ask, in, in at least in my program, where we learn about the humanistic side of psychology. Um, the transpersonal elements, what is beyond what you know. So when you're evaluating a child or you're classifying them or if you're treating them, the first thing you want to do is what they present is potentially less than 1% of the entire abstract reality. Do you really think you are just this human being and you have a, you're a little bump on the earth and you are what you are and you think you know what you are? But at the same time, what if everything that there really is is way beyond your conception? And it, it's, it's out there. It exists. What if, you know, aliens are talking to us or, you know, you've seen that on Facebook. What if, if aliens were to pass our Earth, you know, with a spaceship, they'd zoom off. <laughs> because they're smarter than that, right? Trying to have life with us muggles, right? So really what you're looking at is... A child who comes to you, be the person who is open and open to possibilities and things you could never imagine. What if they were a shaman? What if they had mystical healing powers, but you don't know because they come in and they're a flapping mess, okay? So never ever look at the individual by the structures that were boxed for them with stereotypes from the DSM. So. Let's go through the DSM real quickly. What does the DSM tell you autistic people are or are not, right? So there's like three categories. So the first impairment would be what? Smarties, smarties, teachers, pets, nobody. Nobody. Nobody, okay. <laughs> impairment, social impairment. So there is difficulty with social interaction. Um, I, for example, struggle with knowing when it's my turn to talk, which is why I talk and talk and talk. Because that way I know the rule. I'm still talking, so no one's going to cut in. And that seems to have been working for 40-something years. Um, uh, it, it creates a problem for me because there are people who will criticize me and then they won't want anything to do with me because I've had a friend hang out with me uh, two weeks ago and we were sitting in a restaurant at Ocean Beach in San Diego, beautiful setting, wonderful food, wonderful ambience. And then she says, you know, we've been here for 42 minutes now and you've never asked me a single question about myself. <laughs> like that's just, that, that is a social impairment. But at the same time, who is impaired? The one who can sustain a conversation all by herself um, or the one who desperately needs to be asked how she's doing or she doesn't know who she is, right? So we can mock, so autistics like to call uh, those rest of those people who are not autistic, we call them neurotypicals. We're trying to be kind. I call them the sad normies, um, but we just neurotypical is the standard term right now. And it, it, it joined the lexicon uh, about four years ago, and a colleague um, randomly dropped that word in a conversation, and then about four years ago, it turned into memes and blizzards happened after that. So neurotypicals you all are, unless, of course, you have any kind of diagnosis that's neurological in nature, um, ADHD, dyslexia, um, uh, schizophrenia. Uh, those are individuals who identify as, do you identify, hey, 
hi, I'm, Le I, I, I'm, I'm Lexi, I'm your ADHD friend. No, you don't say that, right? Because that means that you're taking the label of what is a disorder and you're identifying with it. But at the same time, I take something that is my identity, which is autism. I would not be who I am if not for the way my brain is wired. So in my case, I don't say, hey, I'm Henny, I'm living with autism, suffering with autism, I'm a person with autism. That makes it sound like I'm dragging along this baggage, right? Oh, the autism is here in a little bag and I'm lugging it wherever I go, that's my burden. I don't do that. I actually identify as autistic because that's my primary identity. You take the autism away from me and I'm somebody else. So I think of saying a person with autism is about as offensive as saying, oh, you know my neighbor Lisa, the one who suffers from lesbianism, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's just basic. So this is what I've introduced you to now, the difference between um, person-first language or identity-first language. And as professionals, you are going to be trained to use person-first language heavily. Josie and I, we've both had stuff rejected from journals where we couldn't get research published because we insisted on using the term autistic rather than the APA required format of person first. Um, you can't begin to imagine how incredibly redundant articles look when you say uh, the title is evaluating uh, <laughs> Persons with autism for blah, blah, blah. You're already getting tangled up in your head because you lost, by the time you're done with persons with autism, you're no longer remember what you're testing them for, okay? What, whatever happened to the autistic people who wish to be seen, who wish to be known, who wish to be accepted for the identity that they were born with and they embrace it. Yes, question. Our friend has a question. I have a question. You just can't <laughs> see me. Okay, so now I have to stop talking. What's the uh, question? What's <laughs> Rated you. Yes. That's like, or <clears throat> from what you know, is that kind of where there's like a disconnect between professionals and, and researchers and actually autistic individuals where they're so heavily person first because they're, they're not really, they're only looking at the research. They're not really looking at the, the, the reality of it. Do you think that's where the disconnect comes from? Well, I'll tell you what it is. You guys are all, if you're in a master's program, um, I'm pulling up on my computer a cover sheet that I submit with every single thing that I write to excuse myself as to why I use identity first language. And it is because they go out of their way to, so the APA, if, if you want to be a clinical psychologist and you then want, so you then you have to become, uh, get a clinical psychology degree and then if you want to be faculty at a public state university or Harvard then you need to have a degree from an institution that's APA accredited and if the APA doesn't accredit your program you still a PhD you can practice whatever you can do all that but you can't teach in a school that requires APA people so with that said, most training programs will force you to follow the principles of the APA. Um, they'll tell you that your, your essays have to be in APA format and then you have to figure out how to do the commas and the periods and the italics and the titles and the citations and the bibliography because of the APA. So if you ever want to be a professional researcher and you want your work to be out there, you're going to have to write it in their format or you can go dump it in the lake. So with that said, every single article that I've tried to publish, I had to attach a cover, uh, a author personal note. And it says, uh, this author is a PhD student of psychology at Saybrook University in California. This research is independent of coursework requirements and is not in affiliation with the university. The author has not received any funding from any for source. Okay, that's a disclosure, right? And then it says, people first language. The author is aware that the sixth edition of the publication manual of the American Psychological Association stresses the guidelines for sensitivity to labels. Under disability section 3.15, the overall principle is to maintain non-handicapping language to ensure integrity to all individuals as human beings. Under this principle, the manual considers the term autistic to be an excessive label which can be regarded as a slur. 
They're protecting me so that someone doesn't use the term or my diagnosis as a slur. So they're thinking when you tell your friend, oh, don't be such a spaz, you're using a slur that's reserved for people who have seizures. Okay? Or when you say don't be such a fag, you're reserving a slur for people who are queer. And when you call someone, don't be so autistic because they didn't want to come to your birthday party, it's a slur. But at the same time, they have not consulted with actually autistic, and there's a hashtag, actually autistic, on Twitter, which you, sh you should enjoy following. They never consulted with what actual autistic people really want. And that's when we have a problem in, in the United States where the professionals are the ones ruling the laws of the land. So then what happens is if someone like that goes into a position of power, they then dictate how you guys should be taught. So the entire next generation or the past 20 years of professionals, educators, those who have a teacher's license, those who have a uh, OT, PT, they all use persons, uh, a person first language and it's just gross. Um, another issue that goes on and did the, first of all, did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Good. Wow. Oh, Okay, I'm not that good at that, but sometimes I get it right. So it. there is this very similar issue that's going on with those who are professionally trained, which is functional labels, okay? Um, people look at me and they're like, oh, you must be so high functioning. Uh, I've had a psychiatrist who once did the dangerous thing by telling me, oh, your children must be, are they as high functioning as you? So I hijacked 45 minutes of her time and I took it as an educational opportunity and she thanked me. What's most important is that a spectrum. What does, what's a, how, what the heck is a spectrum, right? Autism is a spectrum disorder. So when you are evaluating a kid, all right, let's evaluate them for motor movement. And the first thing that we're gonna test them is balance, okay? So on balance, one out of 10, where did they score? They scored like half, right? So they're like at a five in balance. And then eye contact, okay? So they're like a two over here on eye contact. And then what else are you guys looking for in the clinic? Balance, awesome. uh, hand-eye coordination. Okay, hand-eye coordination. This kid's pretty darn good. So he gets a seven, wow. Um, what else? Uh, following following two-step commands? Two-step commands, speech, joint attention. Okay, okay, this kid's failing. Um, all right. So let's look what happens. Now we have all of these different characteristics or things or whatever you're calling them, little tests. And then when you're done, you need to, you need to connect these dots. Okay, that's your, then my spectrum lives here. And the autism spectrum is here. Hold it. Yeah. All right, so whoever has more above the line meets the spectrum when you're looking for autistic traits, okay? So when you look at a person who is, let's say, nonverbal, okay, because they're very low on speech on their individual test, but then they have photographic memory. And then what, what, what would this be? Impulse control. This would be eye gaze, right? They're very good at faking. I'm very good at faking my eye gaze, okay? All of these things here, sensory stuff. There's an airplane overhead right now, and I have no idea what I'm trying to say. That's a sensory, that's an auditory processing disruption. Is it disordered? I don't know. The fact that you guys can ignore an airplane and keep talking baffles my mind, okay? So who is disordered? So this is the spectrum. You have to respect the fact that every single person who has met the criteria is autistic and it, you don't get to decide which of the stereotypes you're looking at to determine whether they're low or high functioning. When I see a nonverbal kid running around the yard, one of them happens to be my own children, I think that they're higher functioning than me because I spend a, literally 80% of my lifetime just faking and fitting in. 
And what happens is that I'm, on, I'm in the on mode, and then I have to go offline and recover, okay? So when I'm recovering, who is functional? <laughs> the kid who never took it upon himself the burden to make friends with the muggles, okay? He's not going to ask you how your day was. He's not going to look at you when you're talking to him, and he's sure not going to use speech, which your species likes to use for communication. But they're capable of way more, in a way, than uh, the people who, you know, are judging them. Okay, so if you imagine that there's way beyond what you're looking at, these are baby tests that we do to classify people. What if we classified people based on their aptitude, on their strengths, on their talents, on their interests, their passions? So how do you evaluate strengths? in a setting where it's all about correcting motor movement. So one of the things that I do, because I, I am steeped in this kind of work, is I get these kids, I sit here from 8 till 6 every single day, and I give piano lessons to nonverbal autistic children and adults all around the world. So every 30 minutes I'm in another country. What I'm looking for is because I have these motor issues and I now with age and other comorbidities that I have, um, I am having, I'm experiencing decline in uh, motor accuracy, which for a musician is basically the, uh, the, the biggest cosmic joke. Um, so when I want to play uh, on, the, on the instrument, I know I hear it in my head and it's pretty much torturous because I see the keys and I want to play it and I know I can and I know I once could. So there's this like pity party, self-doubt, panic, you know, do I have to retire? Is the world better without me? Am I a burden to people asking them to open up my Gatorades for me and stuff like that? Um, so we can be supportive of people who demonstrate different kinds of neurological issues um, and that manifest in motor movement by helping them find what I call, and this is patent pending, it's their, their own individual sphere of proprioceptive blind spots. So every single person, you all have a proprioceptive blind spot. If you take your hands and you put them out to the side of your shoulders, okay, without cutting off the nose of your neighbor. Wiggle your fingers and go back. Stop wiggling when you can no longer see your hands. Uh-huh. Look at Nirvana. Uh-huh. So you, you can't go much more, right? You can't see it. All right, let me show you how much I can see. Still see it, still see it, okay? That means that I can pretty much see, what, 90 degrees behind my back? right? doesn't mean I have eyes behind my back. It just means that proprioceptively, I can build a picture in my mind's eye of where my body is in space if I tell it to go there. So because I know I'm going there, I now know to look for it, and my mind's eye is finding it. This is a phenomenon that's so hard to explain to people who are not into movement at all, but at the same time, this, this has become a, a, a space for me that my mind's eye has checked out. It no longer knows if I'm wiggling this hand or this hand, or this finger or this finger. Stupid twinkle twinkle, okay? I'm guiding my, with my eyes, my finger, because I know in advance, thumb, thumb, four, four, five, five, four. So if I know that those are the fingers I want to use, I can talk to myself, but I have to reboot between every finger because I can't send all the instructions out. So you guys know about the homunculus in the brain. It's this part of the brain that represents every single region in the body. And the area that it sees larger for some reason, it imagines that that piece is larger, you, then it takes up more room in the homunculus. So imagine a person who had a stroke and they have unilateral neglect. So the left hand, the left arm, the left leg, the left eye, and the left cheek disappears from the homunculus. 
Okay? So you can do some kind of work, and one classic music therapy technique is you bring in a marimba, which is like a xylophone, and they play with a mallet. And as the individual begins to play, dun, 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 dun. oh, shoot, right? Where's the dun? And then what happens is you tell them, it's there, you just have to stretch and reach for it. So even if they can't see past the nose, they'll go and hunt for the sound. And then they come back next week and they're dun, 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 dun. Dun. Got it. All right, week three. Dun, 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 dun. They go because they trust. Week four. Dun, 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 dun. So whatever they've mapped on this side, they can copy and paste it and create a new map on the other side. And even if they don't have the eye yet or the vision, they have the proprioceptive map, you know, completely done. Which is why I use music as note reading as an intervention because the notes tell the brain which finger to use. And if you take a snapshot, you can speed read and then speed play. So I'll show you the difference, what, I, what happens to me when I'm playing um, by ear, and then where I have to give myself individual instructions for every note I'm playing. Now I'll just open some random uh, Jewish music that nobody knows, hopefully, because then you can't judge me. All right, so um, Twinkle, right? Everyone knows, or Josh Groban, you raise me up. Majority for yes. Okay, we got two. That's good. Errors, right? Errors all over. I'm tending to hyperextend. I have Ehlers-Danlos, which means that my collagen is defective, so I get the swan fingers, right? And then I could do the Wicked Witch, and I could do a lot of other cool things, like bend my hip over my shoulders and who knows what, and then cry in pain because I showed off. So what happens is that I tend to uh, cripple myself or hyperextend, and I tend to use the same two, three fingers because I know those are my reliable guys. But now when I'm playing a piece, now... Let's say half of you know a little bit about polka dots on the page. A little bit about the polka dots, right? Okay. So the polka dots tell you what steps, okay? So if I'm knowing that this is my finger one and this is going up a step, I know I have to use finger two to go up that step. So it's building my map for me. And it's just so intuitive, it makes so much sense. So here you get a completely different flavor, radically different because I, I have the map in front of me. It's a movement map. And I never have to use my eyes on my fingers. Maybe I didn't, you know, the selections were a little bit, you know, not really jarring. But yes, question time. You have another question. It's me again. <laughs> oh, go for it. Good voice. So <clears throat> the, when you're reading the music and, and playing that way, do, do you notice the same, like, are your hands still kind of not cramping? I forget the word they use. Are your hands, are you still using the same three fingers or? I'm using all ten fingers and I'm not hyperextending. And uh, one not, uh, compensatory strategy I realize that I use is I'm raising my wrist, which piano teachers hate. They like this claw. But if I hold the claw, then all of my energy goes into sustaining this pose. And then I can't organize. I have no leftover brain cells to tell me which fingers to wiggle. So if I hyperextend my wrist and bring it up like that, flexion, right? Then what happens is that I now have, if you guys do this, you can actually feel the gravity. You can feel your fingers, right? 
Do you feel how heavy your fingers are suddenly? It's like, oh, hello, I've got fingers. Okay, so you want to feel them because if you don't know where they are in space, you're not going to know when to isolate, when to wiggle, and when to press. So one is, I think it was at the conference I met Josie at, there was a guy from Italy and he was doing some kind of study on dyspraxia. And I said, uh, you know, I think I have it. He says, you can't have it. How is it possible? You're not a little autistic child. <laughs> so, well, I have it. So he says, oh, I have a very easy test for you. Anybody have a pen or a pencil or writing instrument? Yep. Yes. All right. Let's, so I want to make sure I watch this. Um, you're going to give it to someone else and they're going to grab it and take a hold of it. That's all. And I want to see how they take a hold of it. So many pens flying. Okay. Oh. So look, yellow pen, person number two. Okay. That's a pencil grip, right? Okay. Are you taking it for granted? Yes, she is. She is. She doesn't even know she's taking it for granted. Okay. This is what happens when someone gives me a pencil. Okay. The thumb goes up because my thumb and the four fingers act like two different people. So if you ever did the potato sack thing or where you tied your leg to another person and you guys had to figure out how to walk in that game, right? Yep. It's two different brains and you're trying to get into a groove is what you're doing and that's how you win. Teamwork, okay? I have no teamwork here. So I have to make a quick second decision. Am I grabbing it with my thumb or am I grabbing it with my fingers? And usually the fingers, since it looks like a gross motor object, I'm going to go for the gross motor decision. So still my finger, my four fingers work like a clump. And the only time I see fluidity is when I have this visual map. Okay, so how does this translate to a, a task that you have at the clinic? Tell me a, a, a intervention task that you have in order to strengthen some kind of movement disorder, and I'll tell you if I think it's appropriate or how you can accommodate to make it different. So what, what kind of things have you been doing with the kids? They take a lot of data and watch and play a little bit. One thing here, I'll offer it up so they're on the spot. So one thing we did on Friday was we had a child who did not like to throw small balls. So like, let's picture yarn balls. And so yep. instead of making it a super task that was just like, let's stand and throw, we ended up having a thousand balls on the ground of all different shapes and sizes. And sometimes we kicked them and sometimes we threw them. And really we were just hoping that they would explore the idea of throwing when it made sense. Throwing a small ball. Okay. I forgot to bring my stash to the front. Give me a sec. Okay. So, yeah. These are all my stimmy toys. We can talk about them later. I wash them with soap before I share. Okay, so why am I bringing this up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, or some people. I know, I'm wicked. Um, I can't throw a ball because I can't figure out how to grip enough so that half of it is in my grip and the other half is about to be let go. I don't know how to release. Mm -hmm. If you don't know how to grip, you don't know how to release. Mm -hmm. But... I, I would have absolutely no problem throwing this guy. Yep. Why? Because there's lots of ways to grab that thing. It's also pretty obvious that it's protruding in a non-expected form. So we had other things too. It wasn't just balls. It was literally those things, rabbits. You yeah. Know. So what happens to me is when I am on a bicycle or a skateboard or a rollerblades or anything that's moving beyond what I can Remember, my, my legs, I have to get them into a groove in order for me to demonstrate that I'm walking like a normie. Okay, right, left, right, left. And remember, there are the, these, this blind spot in the brain is the part where the two people's legs are bound together. So I'm always, in order to just walk like a normal person, I still have to sing that song and get myself going. And the same thing with when I'm on a bicycle. It's taking away that control. I can't get into the groove as fast as the bicycle is going. So I can't ride a bike. I can't ride scooters. They're all over the city. I wish I can hop onto them for a dollar an hour or something like that and go navigate and work out. I can't work out because I can't do anything that's scared. I startle. 
because suddenly I'm doing weights and suddenly a tooth gets knocked out and I don't know necessarily how it got or how that happened. Or, or trying to adult in the morning and making a nice healthy smoothie and all of the stuff's all over the counter and the floor, but I swear I was really trying to get everything into the blender. Okay, so there is this blind spot where I have the intention, I want to do it, and the, the, the signal gets scrambled by the time it gets to the body part that's in charge of doing the task. So one of the really interesting things that we can accommodate the child who is unwilling to throw it, they're unwilling to throw objects that make them feel like they're losing the control. It's like you're telling me I have to do right foot, left foot, but I still don't recall the right foot taking a step because the right foot wasn't mine. It was the right foot of the other guy. So imagine he's living in a body that's split and cut off and there are parts that are not communicating with each other. If he lets go of this ball, he doesn't know if it's going forward, up, or back into his teeth. Okay, so one important thing, always bring the two hands together. Bring them together or have him hold the bar on the wall. If you have like a grab bar, like for the, what people like myself have in the shower, hold the bar and stabilize the core. Because if he's holding something, he's most likely going to be able to evaluate with depth perception and proprioception whether the ball is going to go with, you know, you could say, throw it away from your hand, throw it away, just throw it away, or put it in your pocket. And then the next time you put pocket to something that's grounded to him, he knows where the pocket is. And what if the pocket becomes a laundry bag? Okay, put it in the laundry bag. Okay, now put it harder, make a noise. Okay, in order for him to make a noise, what motivates him to make the noise? It's the same like the lady who couldn't see the, the note past her eye, but she knew she could make a noise if she just stretches into the abyss. Okay? So imagine there are blind spots all over the place. How can you help them ground themselves so that the two legs bound from different bodies, different humans, different brains? It's like all they have to create this symphony for you just to do one little task. Throwing a basketball, don't even get me started. <laughs> I mean, I can release the ball if I awkwardly somehow get a grip and remember one hand has to let go while the other hand is stabilizing. But it's, I'm very likely going to fall together with the ball, tip forward, or I'm going to get a seizure from trying to organize my eyes to coordinate, to look up at the basket while I'm also spotting, right? Like a dancer, you have to spot when you're spinning so you don't fall. So I'm spotting at the pole. I'm, 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 I'm holding myself up. I'm looking at the basket peripherally. All of these crazy things that people think are fun. And then there are people who make millions just doing that every day. So I will or, never be a billionaire. Maybe you might, honey. You're going to invent something awesome. Really? From throwing frogs? Yeah, that's going to be the new rage. Okay. So what else we got? Or, what didn't I cover? Masking. I would like you to talk about masking if you can. Okay. Give me three things that you know for sure I am masking right now. And Josie, that's a question for you. You know them. I think you are masking eye contact. Okay. I think you are masking uh, ability to sit and attend. And I think you are masking uh, caring about talking to us. Wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. So there's way more than that. Okay. Those are my fundamentals. That's on my like pre-gaming uh, list for the morning when I wake up. But once I'm on, I have to remember that I have issues with my salt and my sugars and I always have to check for symptoms. Oh, sweat puddles, mm, salt or sugar. Rest, shower, or fluids, okay? So I am running my entire autonomic system, which is automatic for you guys, your CNS and your ANS, you've learned about that. So your brain has a whole bunch of things that are running automatically. Oh, you ate too much sugar. Now your pancreas is going to secrete insulin so that the sugar can go down so you don't get sick. Lucky for you, if your pancreas decides to be a toddler, you have diabetes. You have to inject insulin, 
because you're not producing it and so on and so forth. I'm running my entire autonomic system full time, juggling the airplane, which completely wipes my brain blank. I have no idea what, where I'm going with any of this. It's horrifying. So what, what I think for me, the hardest part of masking is that I tend to be apologetic with things like the airplanes or when I realize that I cognitively farted out, um, uh, I wrote something down wrong or like I flipped my numbers um, when I'm trying to calculate something and I'll put it incorrectly in the calculator and I'll be like, you wanted to put 250 plus 11. Why does it look 502 plus 12? Where? Who? Who told you that? That's where my fingers went. So masking is the more high functioning the person appears to you, the more damage they're doing to themselves, to their autonomic system, which is taking the, 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 the heat, because now my entire body is frying up. It becomes, masking becomes an endocrine disruptor. It uh, can change your hormones, um, your stress hormones. You, you know about those. Um, there can be what looks like panic attacks and anxiety because there is a flood of serotonin as a result of, you know, intoxicating yourself from too much cortisol. So all of these things are medical stuff that happens, which are measurable in autistic people who stress themselves out by trying to do things that they're not wired to do. So when you think about wiring, what happens to... Uh, your MacBook when you try to install a Windows software. Eh, eh, right? Really, eh would be good enough. But <laughs> in my brain, I have a different operating system. I have the same brain, the same parts, but the way they operate, the way the wires talk to each other from one side of the, uh, of the brain to the other side is dramatically different, which means that when I'm looking... Uh, I'm showing you these two objects, Sharpie and an eraser. You're seeing a tall, thin object and a short, stubby object. My brain sees the letter C in the blank space here. Do you see the letter C? Okay, that's where my brain goes first. I have to work really, really hard to back out of this picture, zoom out, not look at the pixels, Okay, I have a pixelated brain. So everything is on a meta level. I'm seeing details that others don't. And then I have to work really double as hard to say, wait, surely, Henny, you are looking at the space. Most normal people don't look at the space. There's got to be objects there. Back out. Turn it. Get yourself perspective this way, that way, until this comes into focus. And it really sometimes does not. So this is also on a social level. What are the elements that I'm seeing socially that you guys are missing, right? I'm seeing socially, I can sense insecurities. I can sense um, emotions. I can, sell, I can sense whatever is in the space between all of you. But I actually can't sense you as a human being and what your needs and wants are right now. So I can't really anticipate that you're about to ask me a question or that you're fed up of me talking. So this is a, a, a motor issue, it's a medical issue, it's a visual issue, and it becomes, a, on a neurological level, it just basically takes over the whole lifestyle. What are other areas that you think would be affected from masking? Where could you see it causing a cascade of destruction? Well, I'm asking the psychology people. Think, think mentally what it does to a person when they're exposing themselves to a hostile environment for like 20 years in a row. It's kind of, so there's two kinds, right? There's two kinds of emotional reactions. There are those who have the Stockholm Syndrome. They begin to admire their captors. And that's when you start behaving like normal people. You're like, oh my God, girly, girly, doing all those things where I really never did. But you start imitating them. And then you're hashtagging and typing conversations with thumbs like other people. And, you know, I can, I can 
literally take down your whole world and make you realize that you're not really doing them because you chose to, but because everyone's doing it. And that can be toxic to a person's identity because you all know one of those people who has no life, but only knows whether they have a life if they got a certain number of likes on a certain picture of lunch. Like, I haven't eaten lunch unless 20 people liked it. Okay? What if you eat by the light of the refrigerator like me in the middle of the night with nobody watching? Am I still a human being getting some calories in? Right? Um, at the same time, there is another type of people who just are, 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 they question the status quo. And that was me as a very young child. I was like, well, that's bullshit. Um, why would I do that? Um, so I've always suffered from the consequences this, uh, of society punishing me for asking the questions. But I was always, I didn't know at the time, but I was always asking the right questions. And I was asking from a place of intelligence um, because I just, I'm not a rule follower. I'm not a conformist. I can't be told how to do things. You can't tell me to file taxes before April something. <laughs> I mean, you just can't. Whatever, put me in prison. I don't care. Take my money I don't have. I just, I will file taxes when my brain gets to it, when my accountant returns my emails, and that's how it's going to go down. So what happens is that I'm now in the recovery stages because I had the Stockholm Syndrome. For years, I thought the normal people was what I needed to aspire to. I had to do everything their way or and then I would be successful. And the more I did it their way, the more successful I appeared to be. But then I experienced burnout. Okay? Burnout happens to professionals who work for many, many hours um, and the customers deplete them. The clients, usually, if you're working with children, you're going to have the parents who are a pain in the ass. And Josie can tell you more about that. That really, if you don't establish boundaries with the parents, or in, in my work, it's a, a piano studio, so I have studio policies. For a clinic, there would be policies that you give for people, right? And they sign up and they agree to follow those, that they have read the policies. It's there for a reason. Because if you have to reiterate your cancellation policy one more time, you will come home and you will burn something. Mm hmm Okay? So... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, violence is never encouraged. However, what is it? Is it is it domestic terrorism when people inflict a lifestyle onto you and they tell you, "Oh, you are a homosexual. You're going to hell." Wait a minute. We just had that removed from the new DSM. Surprise, I'm no longer mentally ill if I'm queer. So, thank you, queer advocates who got it removed from the DSM. We're no longer sick, so you can't do anything to fix us, okay? And with autism, if eventually it comes out of the DSM, it'll be because of my work. <laughs> I don't think autistic people have a mental illness, but it is in the book for diagnosing people with a mental disorder. That makes it law, honey. Come on. I'm going to fix this. I pride made you a promise. I will fix this problem. Yeah. But at the same time, I have to be sensitive to not speaking for all autistic people. I can only speak for myself. So the way that I can circumvent that issue is by doing research, ethical research, scientific work, and publishing. And that's how I can show my findings that, you know, we can generalize across the whole population. It's really important that when you look at the kid, you're looking at their identity and you're looking at how many blind spots they have and how hard they're working to do this. And I keep forgetting this, this truck thing. What is it called? With the legs are tied together, this game, this stupid, stupid carnival game. You're showing us something you froze a long time ago, so I don't know. Oh, well. Uh, Three-legged race? Yeah. Oh, Three yeah. Three-legged race. Okay. I feel like I will never win that race. I'll be your teammate, honey. Yeah, I know. But you know who's going to fall first. I will drag you. Now, the one who tries harder to tell the other person, you can do it, that's the one who gets hit in the face. Because autistic people don't like to be patronized. Don't tell me you can do it. Tell me how to do it. 
Okay? So all of you in the clinic, you've got these kids who are dying to know how to do it. They have these issues where, yes, they're, they, they feel like they're tied together in a three-legged race. They feel like their right side and their left side have no communication. My own hand, I demonstrated to you, when I want to grab a pencil, it's either or, fingers or thumb. Can't just grip both of them. So these are really, really on a very tiny level and on a very big uh, level, there are, there are differences that are very unique to the autism spectrum. And as I showed you earlier about the dots on the spectrum, when you see a kid who comes in and he's more than happy to throw something, does it mean that he's gifted in math? Or does it mean that he's better at communication? No. Just because he's doing one thing, one thing on your evaluation, doesn't mean you can generalize his aptitude based on his performance on one of the tasks. And that's why we do assessments that involve multiple tasks so that you can score it up and get some kind of median, right? You want to get some kind of average, um, tell, uh, you know, the Vineland is one where you average out someone's functional skills. So for example, on my Vineland, the questions were, can zip independently? Can tie shoelaces independently? Can tie, can, can, can uh, dress independently? Um, shirts, can put pants on independently? Toilets independently, stuff like that. And I had a very hard time answering with yes or no's. Because, uh, yeah, I can probably zip up a zipper with lots of cussing, lots of uh, negative self-talk, going into the pity party, Trying again, like, like Stockholm Syndrome, trying to be like my captors. I feel like I'm an alien living in this earth, right? I don't feel like the others who habitate here. So I'm always trying to, like, I, I think that because I'm only a visitor here to this planet, the, the rest of the people are alien to me. They're, but then it becomes a hostile environment because it's not, what my species needs in order to thrive. So a lot of, yes, pause. Um, I like this train of thought. I have to get them doing other stuff. Could you give me, give them all one parting knowledge of tidbit of what you would want them to go forth in the world knowing after interacting with Henny? Yes, please go out there and know that autistic people are writing. They are discussing, they're vlogging, they're blogging, they're Instagramming. They are here to help the world understand who they are, what their identity is, what their needs and wants are. And when you see an, a professionally published uh, book or research study or a lecture by a professional with letters after their names, if they are not actually autistic, don't waste your time. The professional world right now is, is, is uh, at war with the autistic people. Um, Jesse can tell you more about IRB, but basically across the country right now, if you want to do research where you are interviewing autistic people directly, you are not, you are forbidden. You actually, it's a federal offense if you do that. So this is a, autistic people have become a protected class by the APA and we are considered a vulnerable population. They have done this to exclude our voice from research. Don't call me vulnerable or a vulnerable population when I don't see myself as disabled to the extent that you want to publish and write about. So if you can't access the, the autistic individual directly for research, all of the research out there is going to be secondhand observation. Well, we've observed this child last week and he refused to blow to 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 throw the ball therefore he is he has oppositional defiance disorder because he refused to follow in directions really that's the prevailing professional opinion you will go to these conferences you will hear these people spouting shit like that the first thing you're going to want to ask them is Oh, and who was your uh, research participants? Oh, well, the parents of autistic children. Okay. Well, then you can just walk out. I think that covers it. One more thing. You talked about um, blogs, and their assignment next week is to find an autistic adult blog and report on it. Do you have any favorites floating around these days? I love Edo. 
I D O Kedar K E D A R. He wrote a book, Edo in Autism Land. He is one of those autistics who uh, discovered the letter board. And I don't know if I'm still frozen, but I'm showing you the letter board, um, uh, awesome. which is a laminated sheet with alphabet. And the parent, usually the caregiver, holds the board in front of the child and they begin to stab with one finger on the letters until they are communicating what it is that they're trying to say. So they're spelling to communicate. This is a method that's widely controversial. Uh, people are saying that the autistic is not the author of their own words because they couldn't possibly have written that. It's so philosophical and rich or poetic. And the argument they're giving is the motor movement argument. We know they have dyspraxia and mo movement disorder. So how is it possible that they're pointing with accuracy on a letter board? So who wants to take that fight up with me? Okay, so Ido has published books. He has gone on 60 minutes so that people can see that he's independently stabbing at the letter board. When you're on live television and people are asking you questions and you're answering in response, I ask you to ask your human side, okay, to just to, to, to think critically about what the professional argument is. And the landscape right now for autistic people in the research is very hostile. It's all about refuting anything the autistic has said. So Ido is the one who's not gonna shut up. Um, of course, Nick Walker, one of my favorite autistics, his website is Neurocosmopolitan. Uh, he's a faculty at two universities. He's also a PhD student of psychology in a program that I uh, pulled myself out of. Um, there are more. So Temple Grandin tends to be someone who is like a high profile autistic person because there was her wonderful movie, which you should all watch called Temple Grandin. And, uh, but when you go to any of her conferences or things, you'll see that she's scripting or being prompted to repeat the same information. People have to say that if they've gone to more than one of her lectures, they they just were able to predict everything she said. So she's kind of like reading her book out loud. As far as the self-advocates goes, there are self-advocates you should push for to read those who are using RPM, rapid prompting method, which is the letter board I'm showing you, or those who are using facilitated communication or in general, the acronym is AAC, augmentative devices, communication support. And under the ADA in federal law, we are entitled to accommodate a person who is non-speaking. A person who is deaf has to be accommodated with a translator, a sign language translator. Uh, but a person who is non-speaking autistic right now is not protected so that others should allow them to walk into McDonald's with a letter board and to spell what they want. Right now, this is what it looks like for non-speaking people. And I didn't speak until I was five and basically it was a, a something that I had to force myself to use as a tool because it was a survival issue. It was, it was a, I was in a very hostile situation until I was able to use speech, like between eight and 10, I finally like had it all figured out. So just think about the non-speaking ones. Look for the blogs with RPM. Am I getting kisses? I need to wipe. Uh, I, I love I can't, don't touch me. Ah! <laughs> You're, then I have to give them other things. You're my hero. I yes, owe you go. One was yawning, so let that one go first. I know, right? I will. Okay, cool. You guys all stay smiley faced um, and, and, and be normal and be nice and look for those who are talking because we want to be heard. Thanks, honey. Thank you, you got it. Good night. <laughs>